Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel, and this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series, and I'm super happy to have Jennifer Barnes with us today. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, Frank. How are you? I am doing well on this November 9th, 2021, when we're doing this recording. Uh, let's see. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and we have definitely turned the corner uh, on the weather, so we're getting down to maybe 50s in the morning. Well, I didn't know that the weather ever turned a corner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we still are getting up into the upper 80s, uh, you know, in the daytime. And so some people, oh my gosh, that's hot. Um, but you know, it's, it's actually relatively cool. Uh, and it's why about now where we start getting all kinds of the snowbirds coming in. We get a lot of um, Canadians coming in, for example, coming down for, for the winter in Phoenix. And then uh, when it gets a little too warm for them in spring, then they head back up to, um, to Canada. Um, so yeah, and and where are you at, Jennifer? Uh, so I'm at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at UC Santa Barbara. Ah, very nice. Um, so you have the ocean right there. Absolutely, yeah. I think I'm a two minute walk to the beach, maybe. Oh, very nice. Uh, and it's November, and that's usually when California gets some pretty good weather. Is in October and November, and uh, the fires are usually out, or the floods are usually over. Yeah. Um, and uh, the wind starts blowing a little offshore, and it's it's usually quite pleasant. Uh, so. Yeah, it's nice. It's uh, yeah, like you said, pleasant weather. Um, we have emptied out of tourists a little bit, so I believe it, yeah. yeah, Santa Barbara looks a little different in the autumn than in the summer. I'm learning. It's I just moved here, so I'm still kind of figuring figuring out the environment. Mm -hmm. Just for disclosure, I did my undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara. Oh, I didn't know that. I did. I did. Uh, I got my. Um, BS in physics, um, they're a ten problem. And just to date myself, uh, when I was an undergrad, I was there when uh, when it was known as the ITP uh, started. Um, oh wow! Actually, on the seventh floor of Ellison Hall when it first started out, it didn't have that nice building it has now. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually had a, a reason to go up there as an undergrad. I think it was my sophomore year. I had reason to wander up to the ITP. But that's a whole other story <laughs> why I wandered up there. Um, but yeah, very good. And so what is what is your current position there at the KITP? Uh, I'm a postdoc here. Very cool. Very Thank nice. you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I guess I'm a more foundation fellow. I should probably acknowledge oh, that awesome. the support good. that I'm getting from the more foundation. So they're funding just kind of general research in um, transients and stellar physics across a range of universities. And speaking of, Jennifer, what do you like to do for research? Uh, so let's see. I focus on explosive astrophysics and astrophysical nucleosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in, let's see, I approach it from a theoretical standpoint, um, but my work is very connected to observation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to understand what observing supernovae and kilonovae and other explosive systems can tell us about the physics involved in these explosions. So it's a really phenomenological approach. Cool. Very nice. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ article. Kilonovae across the nuclear physics landscape, the impact of nuclear physics uncertainties on our process powered emission. And Jennifer, take us away. Sure. So let's see. I think if it's okay, I'll just start off with a, a quick introduction to define some terms and make sure that we're all on the same page. Sounds good. Uh, so kilonovae are a class of radioactive transients that we think are produced when two neutron stars merge together. So I don't know if everybody's in the multi-messenger community, but you know you have neutron stars that are um, gravitationally bound to one another, and they're in spiraling, emitting gravitational radiation, and then you know they start to in spiral faster and faster, get closer and closer to merger. And like right at the point of coalescence, um, they merge into a single neutron star, but it tends to be a pretty violent process. So some of the neutron star material gets, gets ripped off and gets ejected out into space. It's gravitationally unbound. Um, and so you have this expanding cloud. Uh, the conditions in this kind of merger are pretty perfect to undergo what's known as rapid neutron capture nucleosynthesis or the R process. So this is where heavy elements are built up through the successive captures of free neutrons onto seed nuclei. So that, you know, if you tear apart a neutron star, you get a big flux of free neutrons um, and then 
those free neutrons bombard smaller seed nuclei, you build up heavy, unstable, um, heavy, unstable nuclei uh, that later are going to decay towards stability. So what all this means is you have some nucleosynthesis happening in the expanding cloud, and then you eventually have the radioactive decay of these synthesized elements, and that's going to provide a source of heat and energy into the cloud, and so it's going to glow. And so, you know, we can observe uh, these kilonovae just like we observe other radioactive transients like supernovae. Yeah. So until pretty recently, this was, uh, you know, kind of a theoretical uh, yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, and then it was only in 2017 that uh, LIGO, the LIGO Virgo network detected gravitational waves from uh, emerging neutron star and then just a ton of ground and space-based telescopes were able to, to follow up that signal, um, locate the electromagnetic emission that was associated with this gravitational wave signal, mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, and then <laughs> find the signal and show that yes, we do get electromagnetic emission. It's pretty consistent with what we think an R process transient should look like. Um, and so I think since then, there's been a lot of interest in refining our understanding. So obviously it was great to get that first observation. It was really exciting to see that, you know, just every, let's see, everything that people had built from a theoretical understanding alone seemed to be pretty well confirmed, um, but there's still a lot of uncertainties that go into our understanding of the R process. Um, and so I, I think there's still a lot of interesting work to be done to try to, you know, understand these, these systems. Um, cool. So, oh, sorry. Cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so one thing that we were focusing on in this paper is, you know, trying to understand just how, how, what we don't know about our process nucleosynthesis, um, goes, uh, can affect our predictions of what a kilonova should look like. Mm -hmm. So, right, the R process, just because of the way it builds up heavy elements, you know, it involves a lot of nuclei that lie very far from the valley of stability, where we don't have a lot of uh, experimental data to constrain theoretical models. So there's a fair amount of uncertainty there. Um, in addition, you know, we also know that how the R process proceeds depends on the astrophysical environment. So even if in a future world, we had some perfect knowledge of nuclear physics and we were able to describe every nucleus really, really well, and you know, we could really understand how the R process would happen, you still are going to have some natural diversity in merging systems, uh, just because you'll have binaries with different masses or um, different binary types, something like that. And so, that can give you a range of behaviors just based on um, astrophysical conditions. Right. Okay. So cool. why is, oh, go ahead. No, nope. good, cool. Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason this is important, um, well, there are a lot of reasons this is important, but, you know, one, I think one key question that we have when it comes to the R process, well, so one key question has kind of been answered and that is, you know, where could this happen? And now, we at least know that it can happen in neutron star mergers. There are some questions though about whether it also happens in other kinds of systems. So like certain classes of supernovae, for example, have been um, suggested as possible our process progenitors. Okay, so I'm sorry, I feel like I'm jumping all over the place, but like I'm one, I'm, I'm one important thing to know about the R process is um, it makes about half of the elements that are heavier than iron. Uh -huh. So, you know, there are a lot of these elements out there and the R process uh, represents kind of a missing piece in our understanding of, of nucleosynthesis. So we know where most of the elements come from and how they're made. The R process is you know, kind of a question mark, maybe not as big of a question mark as it was five years ago, now that we have this Kilanova observation, uh -huh. but, you know, still kind of a major uncertainty. And one of the ways that we can chip away at this uncertainty um, is to observe Kilanova explosions, use our observations to try to deduce how much mass is being ejected mm. uh, by these explosions, um, 
and then you know use that to better constrain uh, our process production through the neutron star merger channel, right? And if we know how much our process we're getting from this channel, that can help us uh, figure out whether we need an alternate source and you know how much our process material we might need from various other channels. Mm -hmm. But a complication of um, just trying to make this, this mass inference is you need to have a good understanding of the, the nuclear physics, right? It's these radioactive decays that are providing the heat. Mm -hmm. And so there's some relationship between the, you know, the total mass of our process material produced and then the energy that you get out of radioactive decays and then the luminosity that you ultimately see, which is what you get to measure. And that's kind of the first step in, in working backwards and in, in trying to understand our process production and mass ejection. Cool. Um, but what's not so clear, just because there are all of these uncertainties that go into our models of the R process, is exactly what this relationship between the mass ejected and the heat generated is. Okay. And, you know, while unfortunately uh, my co authors, oh my gosh, I forgot to mention my amazing co authors, um, could not have done it without like all of these wonderful nuclear physicists that I got to work with. Um, right. So, as I said, Unfortunately, you know, without um, without access to, to like the next generation of nuclear experiments and things like that, we're not in a position to totally solve all the uncertainties in nuclear physics. Um, but I was able to work with an amazing team of theoretical nuclear physicists. Um, so those are some some grad students, Younglin and Kelsey at NCSU. Um, Rebecca Sermon, Nicole Vosh, and Trevor Sprouse, who were uh, at the time at Notre Dame and have since dispersed a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And then Gail McLaughlin and uh, and Matt Mumpower. So these are, yes, this was like a, a really awesome team of nuclear physicists who, who were kind of able to help me figure out, given that there's a lot that we don't know about nuclear physics, you know, what are some possible realizations? So, you know, we can't figure out uh, we can't say for certain how the R process goes, um, but what we can do is, you know, choose a couple of free parameters, vary them, and then get a sense for what the landscape is. Yep. So that was that was a pretty long introduction, but I think that was kind of the, you know, that is the the main goal of this paper is to understand, given what we don't know about nuclear physics, how certain should we be about, for example, the heating rates that we are relying upon to try to better understand mass ejection and our process production in neutron star mergers. Cool, yep. Okay, all right, thank you. Sorry for the back and forth here. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's talk about nuclear physics a little bit. And I think this might be a good time to go to table one, okay. which just kind of, um, you know, gives a good overview of the, the space that mm -hmm. the space of nuclear physics parameters. Okay, so a pretty critical ingredient anytime you're modeling um, any kind of nucleosynthetic process is going to be your nuclear mass model. So this is just a, a theoretical model that allows you to predict the masses of nuclei, you know, anywhere in the, um, in the chart of the nuclides, but in practice, any mass model is, is going to, by design, um, conform with data pretty well where there is data. And so what that means is that all of these mass models, which are of course just a subset of a much larger world of mass models that are out there, they all agree, you know, uh, where for stable nuclei or for nuclei that are close to stability. And then as you move away from stability, um, the predictions start to get pretty discrepant. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's kind of a, like a, very fundamental uncertainty. And if, I think if we just knew what all the masses of all the nuclei were, that would you know, put us much closer to, to the truth, the truth of nuclear physics. Um, okay, so for, um, right, for the R process, fission is actually pretty important, um, particularly in cases where you start off with very neutron rich conditions. So you have what's called fission cycling, um, which is where you build up heavy nuclei through neutron capture, they're going to split apart 
um, then their fission daughters will build up heavy nuclear or will continue to capture neutrons and become heavier. And you know, this process can can repeat until you run out of neutrons, basically. So, you know, the exact way that fission is treated can actually have an impact on the, the final, well, both on the heating that you get because fission produces a lot of energy when nuclei fission. Um, and it also can affect the final abundances because you know, you can imagine that like that would be affected by the um, the mass distribution of fission daughter products. Okay, so fission in the R process or fission as it occurs in the R process is a major uncertainty and that's not something that we were able to fully explore. Um, but we did, yeah, we did look at a couple different ways to model the fission. So we considered a couple of different barrier heights, and then just two simple ways to model fission fragment mass distributions. Um, and then we also looked at different ways to estimate spontaneous fission lifetimes. Um, okay, so that's kind of a summary of, uh, let's see, uncertainties that come from our like lack of knowledge, if that makes sense. So again, all of, you know, mass model and fission prescription, there is one right answer. Uh, and then we also considered some second, secondary, not secondary, but a second class of um, uncertainties. So these astrophysical uncertainties, as I was talking about. So it's typical for simulations of the R process to kind of characterize outflows in terms of the initial electron fraction. So that's just the number of electrons per baryon. So if it's very low, you have a lot of neutrons. Um, if it's very high, you have you're you're closer to proton neutron parity, which moves you away from the R process and towards you know like uh, nickel fifty six production if you're in an explosive regime. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, we're you know tearing apart a neutron star, so we are neutron rich. It's just how neutron rich are we? Um, the second parameter is entropy per baryon, and then there's also an expansion time scale. Yep. So we focused, as you can see mostly on the effect of electron fraction, just since that has been shown to, um, in most cases, be the parameter that has the strongest effect on nucleosynthesis. Yes. Okay, so if you look at, you know, all of these parameters um, and, and think of them each representing a dimension of uncertainty, you can quickly build up hundreds and hundreds of models by varying them all. Um, so, you know, we did, we did that. Yeah, this is a good time to go to figure um, one, perhaps. Yeah, so there are 256 models mm -hmm. um, and we can calculate the R process for, you know, we can calculate what the R process looks like for these. Um, we wanted to do detailed follow-up on a subset of them. So instead of, you know, trying to look at each of 256 individually, um, we just chose 11 models that spanned this space. Um, so figure one here is a good introduction to these 11 models. Um, okay, so on the left-hand side, I'm showing the heat that is generated from our process, from the decay of heavy R process elements as a function of time for each of these models. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the top panel shows the absolute heating mm -hmm. um, and then the bottom panel shows the the heating normalized to a power law with a power law index of negative 1.3 which is often used as a, an approximation to the R process it's a a pretty good approximation but as you can see some of these models you know deviate from that. Um, a lot of them are not pure power laws. They have these kind of cool bump and wiggle features. Yes. Um, okay, and then uh, on the other side, we're looking at the final abundance pattern that you get from each of these models compared to solar. Mm -hmm. So I'll say right off the bat that, um, you know, none of these models is a particularly great match to solar and we're okay with that. We weren't trying to necessarily reproduce the solar abundance pattern. We were we were more interested in what is the range of behavior that you can get out of um, you know the R process. Um, and so solar here means the solar R process. In other words, you subtract it out an S process, or is it total solar? Uh, no, it is solar R process. Solar. R. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good clarification. Um, 
So another thing that is kind of unusual about our model suite can be seen in the lower right panel here, which just shows the mass fraction of the lanthanides and actinides that are produced for each of our models. Uh -huh. um, and it's pretty high. So if you're you know, deep into the Kilanova modeling game, um, this is maybe like ringing some alarm bells. If you're not, <laughs> I'll just, if you're not, don't worry about it. Um, no, if you're not, I'll just say that, um, so it is known that lanthanides and actinides have a pretty high opacity relative to other elements that are produced by the R process or other elements that are synthesized in other kinds of explosions. Um, and so, you know, what that means is that if you, you know, add in a lot of methodides and actinides, you're making your system more opaque, it's harder for radiation to diffuse out, um, and you have a pretty strong, uh, it has a pretty, it can have a pretty strong effect on the signal. So it makes things dimmer, it makes light curves longer, and it tends to make emission redder. Um, so I would say, yeah, like, Generally, anything above like 0.1, a mass fraction of 0.1 for lanthanides and actinides would be considered um, pretty high. And we have some models that go up to like 0. 0. 0.5 almost. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty extreme, but we can talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, okay. So as I mentioned, um, we selected 11 models instead of looking at all 256 because we had this follow-up calculation that we wanted to do. Um, the follow-up calculation is a thermalization calculation. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a great figure for this, but you know the idea is you have this energy from radioactive decay. That energy is going to heat your ejecta cloud, and then eventually it's those thermal photons that diffuse out of the ejecta. That is what we observe. Um, however, this process of heating is not perfectly efficient, right? The, the energy that's released in these radioactive decays takes the form of all of these, well, energetic photons and also fast massive particles. So primarily beta decays, um, I'm sorry, primarily beta particles, fast electrons from beta decay. You could also have um, alpha particles, if alpha decay is important, which in, in some cases in the R process it is, if you know it accesses a certain region of the, um, the chart of the nuclides. And then if you have fission, you also have fission fragments. So um, what we wanted to do as a, a follow-up exercise for these 11 models was to really in detail simulate that radioactive decay and look at how these radioactive particles would move through the ejecta and how efficiently they would transfer their energy to the thermal background. Okay. Um, so just to like give a, just to like illustrate uh, why this might be important. Like, let's say you had a model that had a lot of fission, all of your energy is going into energetic fission daughters. We know from earlier studies that that is a particularly efficient, uh, efficiently thermalizing particle. Uh, in contrast, if you have something where the radioactivity or the radioactive decay is mainly beta decay, um, then you're producing gamma rays, neutrinos, and um, and beta particles. These fast electrons, you know, gamma rays uh, are able to escape out of the ejecta pretty without thermalizing at all pretty early on within a day or so. Neutrinos don't interact with the ejecta at these densities. It's, it's way too diffuse for that. Um, and then you basically are deriving all of your, all of the thermalized energy is coming from beta particles in that, in that limiting case. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, you're losing, you know, maybe half of the energy right off the bat because it's just flowing out of the ejecta. So you, you know, you get a pretty good idea, I think, of the, the diversity and, you know, some of the, like, interesting characteristics of these heating curves just from looking at the energy generated by radioactivity. But if you want to actually make detailed models, you need to go, um, you need to do a little bit of a follow-up analysis, which is what we wanted to do. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I guess we can go to figure two now. I think I covered some of the 
main ideas of figure two, but it might yeah, be nice as a normalization. Very good. Thank you. Illustration. Yeah. We'll move down. Um, yeah. And so this is just showing, uh, I wish I had had this up as I was going through the last, uh, the last little bit here, but this is just showing how the radioactivity in each model is divided among these different um, mm. channels for radioactivity or actually different particles, sorry. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, so we split the energy from beta decay into neutrinos, gamma rays, and beta particles. Mm -hmm. And then we also look at, at alpha particles in fission. Um, and then the right-hand column is just showing the, the cumulative emission spectrum for the gamma rays, beta particles, and alpha particles. We don't have a detailed enough description of fission to do it for fission fragments, unfortunately. But I think the important thing to notice about this figure is um, just that it complicates things a little bit, right? So the, the take home point here is that, you know, not only do you have different amounts of energy uh -huh. that are generated in each of these models, um, but the radioactivity is also different. Like in some cases, the differences are pretty minor. So if you compare, you know, the blue model here with the green model here, maybe those don't look so different. If you compare the blue model, this, um, yeah, the unit F with Y, initial YE of 24. Oh, oh so, sure, the teal model. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm realizing you can't see my my arrow here. Oh, no. um, but yeah, like if you compare this yeah. one to the orange one directly above it, right? Well, These are pretty yeah. different picture of radioactive mm -hmm. decay. So that's one of the motivations for doing this kind of more detailed follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so thermalization is a honestly like pretty picky calculation, and I won't go into all of the details of it right now. I think what I will do instead is skip to figure eight, and we can just look at some of the thermalization results. Okay. So these are, this is what you get if you, you know, take all of that information we have. So the total amount of energy coming out, how it's divided among the particles, how those particles are partitioned into different energies. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you model the emission of these particles, you model them as they rattle around in the ejecta, you figure out what the various cross sections are for them to transfer their energy. And then you just kind of, you tally it all up. And then you can ask, you know, of all of the energy that I am putting into the ejecta, how much is the ejecta actually absorbing and re-radiating as heat? And then again, uh, that heat is the source of the thermal photons that we actually measure. So wow. this is kind of a, an important ingredient if we want to understand that mass luminosity relationship pretty well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are our same 11 models here, and this is the thermalization efficiency. Um, and it's broken up into, again, into um, particle type. So, you know, this is a fraction, but it's kind of showing you, showing you what particles are responsible for the thermalization. Um, as I mentioned, you know, fission is a very efficient um, thermalizer. A lot of the fissioning isotopes that we saw produced in our models had fairly long half-lives. Um, so in models where fission was important, the trend that we tend to see is that its importance grows over time and it has the effect of um, keeping thermalization efficiencies higher than for, um, than for models that, that don't feature fission. Um, in some cases, you actually see non-monotonic behavior. So you kind of see like the ejecta is getting, you know, more diffuse. It's getting harder for these particles to transfer their energy. Yeah, exactly. Like in this brown model here, right? So you see this early decrease that's yeah. just a function of gamma and beta particles. Um, basically having less opportunity to thermalize, uh, but then fission kicks in. And so that, you know, kind of turns that trend around and, and gives you slightly higher thermalization. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty wide range. Yeah. Of, of thermalization efficiencies here, just depending on the mass model. Yeah. yeah and, um, you know, it's, I guess, not too surprising then that, this wide range of thermalization efficiencies coupled with, you know, the diversity that you already had in the, the absolute heating curves. So yeah. the heating curves without any, um, that didn't take thermalization into account gives you a pretty, a pretty wide range of 
um, light curves. Yep. So maybe, which I know is the thing that that everybody <laughs> that we're really interested in, because you can't directly measure thermalization, mm -hmm. right? What you can measure is a light curve. Right. Um, so we can go to figure nine and look at the light curves now. Um, well, we're looking at the the total heating of, or the let's see, let's call it the effective heating curve. So this is, you know, the heat that you're dumping in times the efficiency with which it's thermalizing on the left here. And yes. then if we move to the right, um, you see the the bolometric luminosity for for each model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So again, a pretty big range. Um, a couple. Yep. Things to point out here. So I think the first is that, um, well, should we, let's see. I have to remind myself how the figures go. Okay, great. Yeah, a couple of things to notice here. One is just that um, lanthanide mass fraction here is not necessarily a dominant predictor of light curve width. So if you're Okay. You know, thinking back to some of that early Kilanova modeling papers that looked at opacity, right. you have this expectation that, you know, as I dial up the lanthanide mass fraction, my light curves get dimmer and they get wider. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at model eight, that's kind of this, this darker blue curve here, right, that has a very high mass fraction, um, but it's, you know, it has a much narrower light curve than, for example, model five, say, um, which has a similar lanthanide mass fraction, but for some reason, a much, a much longer light yeah. curve. The yeah. other cool thing that we see is that uh, like model three has a double peaked light curve, which is a little, a little subtle, but it has this it's very early peak. Subtle, but it's there. Yeah. And then a later peak on, yeah, on a longer time scale. Uh, so the way to understand this is probably to move on to the next figure where we have, um, some more light curve calculations. Um, but here we have we have standardized things in a different way. So right, one thing that is unique about our models compared to some earlier Kelanova studies is that we are varying both the effective heating and the composition, and we're doing that in a self-consistent way. Um, so like some of the earlier opacity studies that I was involved in, for example, we would change the composition, but we had some underlying assumption about what the R process heating curve looked like, and we didn't change that. Um, if you take that approach, you get something that looks like the leftmost panel, right? So here we've switched to the color coding. So the color just shows you your mass fraction of lanthanides and actinides, but we're using a standardized heating curve. And in this case, we recover this expectation that um, you know the there's a clear relationship between um, between the composition and the width of the light curve and the peak of the light curve. Yes. Um, but as I said, if you allow both to vary and if you do it in a self-consistent way, at least for the models that we looked at, you know that's this middle panel here. Um, here you are really uh, breaking. <laughs> you are breaking that nice pattern. And you can see that um, if you look at the right panel where we've standardized the composition, so same composition, but we're just using the, um, we're using different heating curves. Right. You're still, you know, you're still breaking that pattern a little bit, um, okay. or you're still breaking that pattern significantly, I should say. Okay. So I think, <laughs> yeah, what this is what this is showing us is that you know you can't think about lanthanide or you can't think about composition in a vacuum, right? The right. effective heating curve um, and the shape of it, you know, can also have a strong effect. Like I would argue for this set of models, which you know, again, we're we're chosen to be pretty diverse and to span the space. So this is this is maybe an extreme set of models, but for this set of models, you could say that the shape of the heating curve um, is even more important than the lanthanide mass fraction in setting what these light curves look like. Yes. Um, oh, and I'll just say that <laughs> there's a, it's not like magic, there's a simple reason for that, which is just when you, let's see, the width of the light curve is related to the slope of the heating curve, right? So if you're dumping energy in really steeply, that's going to lead to a, an earlier peak 
Right. Um, if it's more shallow, you know, you're doing a better job of compensating for the energy that's lost to adiabatic expansion that's going to stretch the light curve out. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a, yes. uh, yeah, not surprising. I think that's a consequence of like simple R net models, um, but not one that I had appreciated before I did this work because I, I think the Kilanova modeling community had, or at least us, I, <laughs> I had been yeah. in the habit of, yeah. <laughs> of assuming, of assuming that there was a particular, you know, heating heating curve, and and not thinking enough about how that might change. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Always criticize one's own work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's uh, you know, but then we improve on it, and we. Oh, that's how the game works. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, I, de I definitely don't want to malign others for my own mistakes. No, no, no. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. Oh wow, time has flown. At least for me. Um, Okay, I think the last thing that I will talk about before I wrap up here is, can we go to figure 12? I will, figure 12. Well, actually, sorry, let's back up to figure 11. Um, so having discussed the importance of the, the shape of the heating curve, the last thing I want to talk about is mm. these double peaked light curves. Oh. So this is kind of a cool consequence of the temperature dependence of opacity. Um, okay, so opacity in these kilonovi is primarily due to lanthanides and actinides, which we talked about their, their um, mm. what is setting the opacity. Um, it is also linked to ionization state. Since lanthanides and actinides dominate, it's really set by their ionization state in the ejecta. Um, okay, and Bound bound opacity tends to hit local minima at temperatures that correspond to um, ionization temperatures. So, you know, basically what happens is right as you are ionizing, like right after you've reached a temperature that just allows things to be ionized, you have a population of ions. Um, there's enough energy for them to be ionized, obviously, but not a lot to excite atoms uh, much above the ground state. So what that means is that there's a, it's kind of a, it's homogeneous from an atomic, um, how do I want to say it? Yeah, it's, there are just a lot of electrons sitting in a very few number of energy levels, if that makes sense. And so yes. there are, you know, relatively few photons at the right energies to be absorbed by those atoms and to excite those electrons. Um, okay, and so, you know, and then as the temperature rises, of course, you get a, a broader distribution of populated levels and you get more opportunities for absorption, but you can have this local minimum. Um, in this case, we're seeing it right at the, the second ionization temperature. So right when these um, lanthanide and actinide ions are, are doubly ionized. Yeah. Okay, and that is relevant for our models if we move down to figure 12. Um, because some of our models generate a lot more heat than models that had been considered before, um, or models that I had considered before. And so, okay, this is kind of a complicated figure. Um, X axis is time, uh, Y axis is enclosed mass coordinate. Um, okay. And then the color coding is just the ionization fraction of lanthanides and actinides uh, solved assuming local thermodynamic equilibrium, which should be okay in these epochs. Um, okay, so what we see from, okay, let's see. So sorry, that's the bottom panel. Right. And then the black line is tracing a, an estimate of the photosphere. So this is tracing where the Rossland mean opacity is equal to one, which, is not a perfect way to think about uh, like multi wavelength radiation transport, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but is, you know, a, a, let's see. It's an approximation. It's a good approximation. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, anyway, what we see is in some of these models that have very high heating, we have at pretty early times, at least, extended highly ionized regions. Um, uh, enough so that the photosphere, for example, in the red model and the yellow model, the photosphere at early times is actually forming within these highly ionized regions. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And then later, of course, the system expands, the heat being put in is going to drop, the ejecta is going to recombine, um, and that's going to raise the opacity. And then, yeah, like you can see in this yellow model, the photosphere actually jumps outward. So what this produces is kind of a two-phase light curve. So you have an early, you have something that looks like a, an early light curve that's characterized by a pretty low opacity. That low opacity is caused by the, the high heat and the ionization. Um, and then, you know, later, uh, as the ejecta recombines, you're kind of starting over and going through a, a second, yeah. a second phase with a higher opacity. And that's what gives rise to these kind of this uh, early peak and this, this secondary peak. So depending on your, depending on the exact shape of your heating curve, you can get some kind of interesting looking multi-phase light curves. Um, okay, and then- Very cool. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah, I think the last thing I wanted to say, sorry, I know I said that was the last thing I wanted to say, um, but I just want to circle back really quick to this idea of are our lanthanide mass fractions too high? Like, do they rule out some of these models? Um, would everything look totally bizarre if we had lanthanide mass fractions that high? Right. And I would argue that not necessarily. So if you look at um, figure 17, this is showing for each of our models the spectrum of uh, the kilonova at the time of bolometric peak. Um, Okay, and it's it's organized uh, from top to bottom with increasing lanthanide mass fraction, and definitely when you move from a mass fraction of like point you know zero two or zero three up to like point two or point three, you yeah. see a shift of the spectrum to the red. Um, but there's a point, and the point seems to be somewhere between you know point one and point two, beyond which cranking up the mass fraction doesn't have a strong effect on the spectrum. Um, and that's just because the opacity saturates. Like once you get to a certain point, all or most of your opacity is coming from lanthanides. Adding more lanthanides doesn't change that. necessarily change that picture. Right. Um, so yes, while I Interesting. definitely acknowledge that these are a pretty extreme realizations of the R process in terms of lanthanide and actinide content, um, I would say it doesn't look like they're you know, it doesn't look like they're ruled out um, from spectrum considerations alone. Um, okay, so yeah, I think that is the basic story of this paper. Um, the main thing that we wanted to accomplish with this, I think, was just to remind the community that while we have had some great successes in understanding the R process and, you know, have kind of started this uh, started along this new path of directly observing our process nucleosynthesis and decay via kilonovi, there are still a lot of uncertainties um, and we should still be motivated to, well, one, we should keep these uncertainties in mind when we're saying things like, oh, you know, the 170817 kilonova produced, you know, X solar masses of our process material. Um, and then hopefully it should also motivate us to pay close attention to like upcoming nuclear physics experiments um, that are aiming to really map out the, the chart of the nuclides and get some new and unprecedented measurements of some of these exotic species that are so important for the R process. Indeed. Yeah, FRIB is going to be um, huge. Yeah, I agree. Some of this down. Absolutely. Well, Jennifer, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article thanks oh thank you yeah thanks for the opportunity sure so you touched on a little bit and some of it was just inherent in the plots that that we're seeing um uh but where do we where do we go let's say over let's say the next five years or so um you know we mentioned frib for example as a terrestrial experiment and um I think one of the takeaways that I took anyway from the, the plots is just how much difference you get from different mass models. So are there plans to try and nail down different mass models, you, perhaps using uh, FRIB data? Um, are there other observational? You know, we all hope that we get a second neutron star merge, right? right. I mean, yes, we all hope that. <laughs> um, uh, but barring that, um, you know, what, uh, what else can be done to um, 
uh, nail down sort of the R process from neutron star mergers. So where do we go in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think as you alluded to, a lot of it comes from nuclear physics experiment. Just the more we can cut down on those uncertainties, you know, that, yeah, the more we can cut down on the things that we just don't know versus the things where we expect natural diversity that we can't control, the better position we're going to be in. Um, yeah, so let's see, there's uh, another, Ephraim. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry? I was gonna say in another, uh... Another one where terrestrial experiments might be able to help, or at least uh, calculations, is, is the opacity of, of lanthanides. So yeah. A done deal. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And that that is one, you know, there were some simplifications that we had to make in our radiation transfer models. Um, we have a pretty good, uh, like a pretty good, you know, numerical models of opacities for most of the um, lanthanides, but like we, it would be great to have them for all of the actinides as well. And, you know, for, we're working to kind of shore up our, um, our opacity resources for like the lighter R process elements, for instance, because we're still, we're still, uh, using some, sim we're using some simplified compositions because we don't have all of that opacity data. So yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. Um, just anything that can improve the radiation transfer. And for instance, like a lot of um, a lot of the atomic data that I use, we've done calculations that go through the first couple ionization stages. But if you wanted to look at like you know signals at very early times when things were very hot, or like push things into extreme regimes where you had a lot of heating. Um, it could be really cool to do that, um, but we would, yeah, we require some additional synthetic atomic data and then um, any kind of laboratory experiments that can be used to help calibrate, uh, calibrate, because a lot of the, yeah, most of the opacity calculations are, you know, are numerical and we're using synthetic data. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, great. Um, you know, I think, uh, over the next five years, as we sort of nail down what the mass model is of nuclei, and as we improve our um, knowledge of opacity calculations, that would be very cool. And who knows, maybe one day somebody will actually observe a, a spectral line of gold in, in uh, the Kila Nova, or a Kila Nova. That would be cool. That would be very cool. Would, um, then we'd have direct, you know, Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, with um, JWST and... Ooh, right. Right. Like if we can use, like that has amazing uh, sensitivity out into the mid-infrared, which, you know, we really didn't have, have access to the kind of those wavelengths for this first kilonova. Um, if we could look deeper, you know, out into redder wavelengths and then hopefully be able to observe a kilonova at very late times, get some information on the nebular spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that when the when everything is like a little bit less broadened, a little bit less blended, yeah. you can get some, hopefully get some data that's easier to match to like particular elements and or particular ions. Um, so I think that, yeah, that would be um, wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like a bit of a reach right now, like maybe it's too much to ask for, but you know, we've got time, yeah. so. You don't ask, you don't get, so very cool. Uh, Jennifer, that will do. I want to thank you so much again for talking us through your very lovely article on Kilanova. And you. everyone, I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better, and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you.